It is a great honour to be invited to give the 2015 Hal Wooten Lecture. Um, and I, can I say also, before I really get started, I'm very honoured that Martin Krieger is present today. Martin Krieger, uh, a member of this faculty, um, is one of the very best teachers I have ever encountered. Uh, true it was in connection with philosophy rather than law, so I can't necessarily assess him as a teacher of law, but I will never, ever forget uh, his teaching of philosophy at the Krenlana program in 2001. Um, it, it's interesting to see the people who've given this lecture before, and there is, of course, a famous and well-documented story that Jose Ramos Horta gave the Hal Wooten lecture in 2006. And until moments before he gave it, he thought it was a memorial lecture. <laughs> <laughs> He was reminded just in the nick of time that Hal Wooten was alive and present. <laughs> uh, he adjusted the tense of a few sentences and apparently proceeded just fine. Um, as if to underline the point of his continued um, existence, Hal himself gave the lecture in 2008, which <laughs> at least was a warning for those in the past and a hint for those in the future. Um, and it's a delight to know that he's here tonight and um, because it's many years since he's been a judge, um, I'm able to say nice things about him. Um, many barristers say nice things about judges, usually in anticipation of favours soon to be delivered. It's a contemptible practice. I understand it doesn't work anyway, um, but um, I think I'm allowed to be nice about him without any suggestion that I'm expecting some reciprocal advantage. Um, his, his 2008 speech is very interesting, and it, so much so, in fact, that um, my talk tonight has Hal's 2008 talk at, appended to it at the back, so you get two for the price of one, which is quite good. Um, he he um, noted in his talk that since the end of the Second World War, the practice of law had tended toward being a business more than a profession. And it's certainly something that I've noticed in uh, the course of my time at the bar. Uh, the solicitor side of the profession especially seems to be run much more on business lines than on, um, than on the lines of traditional professions. But it has to be said that for Hal Wooten, that change never affected the way he did things. I was also interested in his uh, repeated references to literature in the course of his talk in 2008. Um, he re referred to Lord Wavell's um, collection Other Men's Flowers, to Shakespeare, to Dickens, to Thackeray, Henley, Cervantes and, and um, Borby, who I'd never heard of. Um, the Henley thing was interesting because in his talk he quoted the first version, the first verse of it, which reads, out of the night that covers me, Black as the pith from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Um, a very apt verse for Hal Wooten to have recited. And since I didn't know the poem, Invictus, before I read the 2008 speech, I hunted it out and came across the second verse, which reads, In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. And I thought that I had been given the bludgeoning of chance as my title to address tonight. Hal very politely corrected me this evening, um, reminding me that he's not only alive, but he's also still alert. <laughs> and he said he had an email that would prove that I had chosen that phrase as my topic. Um, I accept the correction. Um, I, I, think, I think the reason I chose that topic, although I'm really not sure now since I didn't think I'd chosen it at all, <laughs> But I expect that the reason was uh, because um, my career has been shaped almost entirely by chance. It would be very luxurious to be able to look back and say how carefully crafted it was, but actually it's all been a matter of accident. And, and uh, in recent years it's brought me into contact with people who have truly been bludgeoned by chance. And I think most lawyers actually spend more or less time, typically in their early years, dealing with people who've been bludgeoned by chance and we need to respond appropriately to that circumstance. Um, when I say that my career's been shaped by chance, um, I hope this is the reflection that I meant to reflect on. Um, <laughs> 
The, um, you know, I don't want to get a bad mark. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, when I finished year 12 at school, which we used to call matriculation, I did well enough to surprise everyone, including myself, and I didn't know what I should do next. Uh, when standards were lower in those days, I was accepted into four or five faculties, a couple at Melbourne University, a couple at Monash University. I toyed with the idea of doing arts or engineering, but eventually chose to do law and to do law at Monash specifically because an ex-boyfriend of my sister was doing law at Monash. And I thought, well, at least I'll know someone so I won't be lonely on the campus. <laughs> um, it's probably not the most ideal way to be turned into a career in law, but <clears throat> that's how it worked. Um, then chance took another uh, hand because I wasn't really planning to be a lawyer at all. Uh, I wanted to be an artist, um, but I suspect that the world of art has benefited by my not being one. <laughs> Um, but um, I, th I was also interested in having an income, so I thought I would choose that um, occupation du jour back then, which was being a management consultant. And so I picked up an economics degree, which would equip me to be a management consultant. And um, I enjoyed my time at Monash very much, so much so that um, there were various activities that you could choose. Back then, you had many more choices of activities. It was a couple of years before I realised that the Notting Hill Hotel was not on the campus. <laughs> um, uh, but one of the activities I did enjoy was mooting, the mock court thing. Now, mooting, in those days, was voluntary. It's now actually an embedded part of the course, which is not something I necessarily approve of, but it was voluntary back then. It was good fun. Only nerds did it. So I was attracted to it, and it was a limited field, which was good. Um, and so, to my excitement, I was asked to take part in the Monash University InterVarsity Mooting Team in the Australian New Zealand Inter uh, Law School Society InterVarsity Mooting Competition in New Zealand in 1971, I think it was. Now, I'd never even been overseas. I hadn't even been to Tasmania. The idea that someone was going to fly me to New Zealand uh, to do something which was fun seemed like a really, really good thing. And um, as chance would have it, I won the prize, the Blackstone Cup, as the best individual speaker. And there was a prize giving at the end of it and a drinks thing and so on. And I was talking to the Chief Justice of New Zealand who'd presided over the final moot. He asked me what I was planning to do. I wasn't prepared to say, I want to be an artist. So I said, I'm going to be a management consultant. <laughs> he said, you should go to the bar. And with that five seconds of career planning advice, <laughs> I decided to be a barrister. <laughs> it only occurred to me last year that it would be very entertaining if what he meant was, go and get another glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> if my career has been shaped by chance, it's a delightful thought that it might have been originally uh, shaped by a complete misunderstanding. Um, because of my um, having uh, majored in accounting in my economics degree, I found myself at the bar um, early on doing quite a lot of work for the tax commissioner and then trade practices work and so on and so forth. It was uh, not as riveting as the career at the bar that I'd hoped for, especially because a friend of mine had given me a copy of Irving Stone's biography of Clarence Darrow. Now, for the younger members of the audience, if you've never read about Clarence Darrow, great American trial lawyer from the first half of the 20th century. He was absolutely astounding, really, really worth reading about and understanding. He was a person who devoted himself to the underdog, to fighting the great unwinnable fights, the big fight against capital punishment, uh, the fight which most people will remember vaguely uh, of the, um, the Scopes monkey trial, the Tennessee monkey trial in which the forces of uh, conservatism came headlong into conflict with uh, the idea of uh, evolution. Um, Darrow was an astonishing lawyer. He sailed a bit close to the breeze occasionally, but very interesting lawyer. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great to be like that? But um, doing tax and trade practices didn't seem to be quite on that path. But then, in 2001, uh, chance bludgeoned me into a new direction. Um, many of you will remember that in late August 2001, a little ship, a little boat called the Palapa, with a cargo of Hazara refugees from Afghanistan, was heading across the Indian Ocean towards Australia. 
it began to fall apart. Australia contacted the uh, Norwegian cargo ship, the Tampa, and asked the captain to rescue the people on the Palapa. The captain of the Tampa thought that the Palapa might have maybe 50 people on board and was astonished when he counted 438 people up the rope ladder and onto the deck of the Tampa. Uh, a number of them were in a poor state of health and so he headed towards Christmas Island with a view to disembarking them at Christmas Island, a little outpost of Australian sovereignty uh, in the Indian Ocean. Um, the, uh, he was not only concerned for their... Uh, health, he was concerned at the fact that the Tampa was licensed to carry 50 people. He had 48 crew and 438 unexpected passengers. Uh, anyway, when he, um, when he entered Australian territorial waters off Christmas Island, John Howard sent out the SAS in a, uh, a Zephyr and they took com command of the bridge at gunpoint. And then there was a standoff. Um, and all any of us in Australia understood of it was he was a bedraggled bunch of people being held hostage on the steel decks of a ship in the tropical sun. And I must say, it struck me as a bad way to treat people. I didn't know anything about refugee policy or maritime law or anything like that, but I just didn't think it was right to hold a bunch of people hostage on the steel decks of a ship in the tropical sun. Now, a friend of mine, John Manetta, who deserves enormous credit for his creativity, thought up a case idea which he thought might resolve the impasse. And he asked me if I'd act pro bono for the people on the Tampa, and I said, of course. Um, and, and the case was pretty hard fought. It started on a Friday night and ran Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and it adjourned for the judge to reserve his, uh, for the judge to consider his decision on the afternoon of the 5th of uh, September. He gave judgment in our favour, let it be noted, uh, at 2.15 in the afternoon, Melbourne time, on the 11th of September 2001. Not a good time for a win for Muslim boat people. Uh, the next day, everything, everything changed radically. No longer were there terrorists, there were only Muslim terrorists. No longer were there boat people, there were only Muslim boat people. John Howard started using the language of illegals and queue jumpers to demonise them. And I do recall with some sense of annoyance that while there had never been a hint that any of the people on Tampa were anything other than simple asylum seekers, um, in the appeal, which took place a couple of days after the judgment, it was first suggested by counsel for the Commonwealth that some of the people on the Tampa might have been terrorists. There wasn't a shred of evidence to support that, but in those heady days you could get away with any reference to terrorism. It was plausible and deeply damaging. Now, my economics degree taught me that when the price goes to zero, the demand goes vertical, and so I found myself being asked to do pro bono refugee cases. <laughs> And that led me to some really uncomfortable discoveries. I had learned quite a bit about our refugee policy and law during the course of the Tampa litigation. Um, but uh, not long afterwards, I learnt of the case of a young Hazara man from Afghanistan who had been re removed to, uh, from Nauru because the Pacific Solution was set up during the Tampa case. Uh, he was removed from Nauru and sent back to Afghanistan. And most Hazaras who were returned during those times in early 2002, most of them uh, fled across the border into Quetta. But this man decided to go back to his village where the, the Taliban hunted him down and they dragged him out of his house and threw him down the village well and dropped a hand grenade after him. I, I, I learned of the case of a man, uh, well, it was involved in a case for a man who had fled Saddam Hussein's regime. Uh, this man was uh, locked up in, I think, Woomera initially. He was uh, noted in the department's files as having been tortured at Abu Ghraib prison by Saddam Hussein's regime. Uh, he, they noted that the form of torture that he most, uh, was most terrified by was being held in a tiny room because he'd been electrocuted through water on the floor of his cell in Abu Ghraib prison. 
just randomly electrocuted. He was terrified of being locked up in a small cell. Now, after about 15 or 18 months, in a pattern that's thoroughly recognisable, he fell into hopelessness and despair because no one could tell him how long he would be detained for. No one could tell him what his future held. And it is typical that after 15 or 18 months, people fall into hopelessness and despair. This man um, started harming himself, which is also a fairly characteristic response for people who feel utterly hopeless. And his form of self-harm was cutting. He would, if he could get a bit of broken glass, he'd cut himself. If he'd get a bit of razor wire, he'd cut himself. Whenever he cut himself, the department would do two things by way of treatment. First, they would give him Panadol. Second, they would lock him in solitary confinement in a small cell. It didn't help. He would come out, he'd be worse, he'd cut himself again, they'd give him Panadol and lock him up in a small cell. That went on for five years. Eventually, he was in such a distraught mental condition that other detainees were telling immigration, this man is in desperate need of psychiatric help. Now, back then at Woomera, um, psychiatric help was provided by a subcontractor to IHMS. The subcontractor was a psychiatrist who lives in New South Wales, country New South Wales. He would fly his private plane from country New South Wales to Woomera once every few weeks. And if you were in serious need of psychiatric help in Woomera in those days, you would get to see the visiting psychiatrist about once every six or seven months. Um, this man needed much more urgent attention. But the department said that he was OK. Eventually, um, a, a legal team from Adelaide went to the federal court and, ultimate, and fought for an order that this man be taken to the Glenside Psychiatric Hospital for assessment and, if necessary, treatment. Nothing more adventurous than that. The, the department resisted that and fought the case for two weeks in the Federal Court of Australia. Eventually, the judge ordered that that man and a few others be sent to Glenside Psychiatric Hospital in Adelaide for assessment and, if necessary, for treatment. And when that man was admitted to Glenside, he was examined physically and mentally. And on physical examination, they noted he had 10 metres of scarring on his body from his self-harming in immigration detention. And this was someone who, according to the department, needed nothing beyond Panadol and solitary confinement. Um, but the case that really uh, bludgeoned me into a new and incredibly self-damaging course was the case of a family from Iran. This family belonged to a small pre-Christian sect that is regarded by the majority as unclean. And anyone who wants to know what discrimination and persecution is like, try belonging to a group regarded as unclean by the majority. Um, they stayed on in Iran uh, because generations of their family had lived there and were buried there. But after a horrendous experience that involved the 11-year-old daughter, they fled one night and ended up in Woomera. And there, there was mum and dad and two daughters aged 7 and 11. And after about 15, 18 months, they were all doing it pretty hard, but especially the 11-year-old girl. Um, she had given up. She had stopped eating. She'd stopped grooming herself. She'd stopped brushing her hair. She'd stopped brushing her teeth. She was frightened to go to the toilet block, which was hundreds of metres away from their cabin. And so she'd wet the bed at night. She'd wet her clothes during the day. A psychiatrist from Adelaide heard about it, went to Woomera, did an examination, um, spoke to the parents, spoke to the child, delivered a devastating psych report to the department saying it's essential that this family be moved to a metropolitan detention centre so she can get daily psychiatric help. She desperately needed it. She was at great risk. And once every seven months was not going to do it. The department eventually relented and moved the family to Maribyrnong in the western suburbs of Melbourne. And um, their case was then being looked after by Con Karapani Gietidis from the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre. Um, although the reason for moving them to Maribyrnong was that the 11-year-old girl needed daily psychiatric help, for the first two and a half weeks of their stay in Maribyrnong, nobody came to see her. Not a doctor, not a psychiatrist, not a clinician, not a nurse, not a social worker, nobody at all. And on a Sunday night in May of 2002, while her mother and father and her young sister were off having their evening meal, this little girl alone in their cell in Maribyrnong took a bedsheet and hanged herself. 
she was still suffocating when the family got back to the room. Um, the, the, um, she and her mother were taken to the general hospital nearby. They had two ACM guards with them, so as a matter of legal analysis, they were still in immigration detention. Um, the girl was placed into the intensive care unit. Con heard about this and went out to the hospital at about half past nine that night. Uh, he said g'day to the guards who know him, because he's a regular visitor at Maribyrnong. He said he just wanted to speak to the mother to see if there was anything he could do to help. And the guards said to him, no, you're not allowed to see them because lawyers visiting ours in immigration detention are nine to five. And they sent him away. He then rang me at home at about 10 that night. I'll never forget that call. And that one instant um, made me think this is not possible that our country could behave like this, to drive a child to try and kill herself and then turn away someone who's trying simply to offer ordinary human help. And, uh, of course, it continues to happen right now as we speak, right now in Darwin, in Wickham Point Detention Centre in Darwin, there's an Iranian family who've been on Nauru uh, for over a year. They've been brought back to Australia because the father has a medical condition which cannot be dealt with on Nauru. The daughter, who is five years old, uh, is showing all the signs of having been sexually abused while on Nauru, and she is so desperate not to be sent back, although they're threatening to send them back in the immediate future, she is so desperate not to be sent back to Nauru that she has started trying to kill herself, a five-year-old child. She's been swallowing detergent, swallowing shampoo, uh, doing whatever she can turn her mind to that might end her life rather than be sent back to Nauru. If you ever want an eloquent illustration of how cruel our offshore processing system is, imagine that it will drive a five-year-old girl to try and kill herself rather than go back. Um, the cases like this, I mean, I thought, you know, you get it one or two cases like this, but it seemed that every case that I got involved in threw up facts that were more and more florid, worse and worse illustrations of the worst kind of debasement of Australian values. And, and so I started to speak publicly about these things. Uh, and it was only the chance of getting involved in cases like this that persuaded me to do it, because as the lawyers in the room will know, uh, for barristers to speak publicly about things is not really the done thing. And um, I discovered increasingly, as friends turned their backs on me and colleagues I, who I thought liked me began giving me a wide berth, I began to realise that speaking out against the received wisdom, namely that we're protecting ourselves from something or other, um, <laughs> I've never quite understood what it is we're protecting ourselves from, um, but it, in fact, I've never actually found five-year-old girls threatening. <laughs> and the thought that we need to drive them to try and kill themselves doesn't strike me as having any rational support at all. In any event, I found myself speaking up, but being uncomfortable about it because of the professional constraints. But it all came into focus one night. Kate and I were a very fancy social function. And... Um, the wife of a very senior, highly respected professional colleague uh, sidled up to me and said, oh, do you think it appropriate that a member of the bar should speak publicly about matters like this? And I answered with more wit than preparation, do you think it appropriate to know about matters like this and remain silent? I thought it was a pretty good answer, actually. <laughs> That conversation uh, significantly changed my approach to these things because it explained to me, and I hadn't tried to think it through, it explained to me why it was necessary uh, when seeing something as dreadful as what we are doing. It's necessary to speak up, not, as some might think, not out of hostility to our government, but out of concern for our country, the country that I grew up in, the country which I think actually does have really decent values, but which has been led onto a path which leads to very dark places, and how far it goes, we will not know. 
There's one other instance that I was thinking of talking about, a case of, of a man called Amin. I've got to keep an eye on the time, don't I? I'm get, apparently I get shot or something if I... <laughs> <clears throat> um, Amin had been in Australia, also a refugee from Iran. He'd, he was in Australia with his eight-year-old daughter. Their case was wending its way up through the system. Uh, they were in Baxter, the, the Immigration Detention Centre at Baxter. Worth remembering Baxter. It's closed now. Baxter was purpose designed and built for the Howard government. It's a great, extraordinary construction uh, in the South Australian desert out of Port Augusta. Uh, Baxter, um, interestingly, is surrounded by a huge glittering fence. It's quite a, a vision, actually. And a, a few months before it was opened, um, I had been invited to South Australia to take part in a panel session about issues of this general sort. And I was aware that one of the other panel members was going to be the then Deputy Secretary of the Department in charge of the Compliance Division, which is the Lock'em Up Brigade. And as luck would have it, um, Chance shoved a ground plan of the soon to be open Baxter Detention Centre off the back of a truck and it drifted elegantly onto my desk. <laughs> and, but for that document having been bludgeoned my way, I um, wouldn't have been able to ask the question which I did ask in front of the audience. I asked this um, Deputy Director of the Department, Deputy Secretary of the Department, I said, why is it that an electric fence that surrounds the soon-to-be-open detention centre is described on the ground plan as a courtesy fence? I can't say anything courteous about electrocuting people. And she looked at me coldly, I could almost call it the death stare, but it wasn't quite, looked at me coldly and said, it's not an electric fence, it's an energised fence. <laughs> So I thought, well, with attitudes like that in the department, we're all really in trouble. Anyway, Armin was in Baxter, the family-friendly detention centre with the energised courtesy fence. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they'd been there quite a while. One morning, there's a knock on the door of their cabin, and in March, five guards. They order Armin to strip, because they think he has a cigarette lighter. Now, for a person who's not committed any offence in the country, of course, having a cigarette lighter would be a heinous crime. Um, but he refused to strip, not only because of the Muslim concern about being naked in front of other people, but his eight-year-old daughter's in the room, so he refused. They roughed him up a bit, handcuffed him, dragged him off to the management unit. The management unit is 13 solitary confinement cells, each about two and a half metres square, bare concrete, no furnishings apart from a mattress on the floor, um, no privacy because you are video recorded 24 hours a day and for that purpose the lights are left on 24 hours a day and the occupant of the cell is not allowed anything except the clothes they stand up in, um, not allowed anything to read or to write with, no TV, no radio, no CD players, no form of distraction or entertainment, just 23 and a half hours in every 24, they are isolated and alone. But he was allowed a 30 minute visit from his daughter uh, once every 24 hours. Things went along okay for the first couple of weeks and then she missed a visit and he complained to the employee of the Department of Immigration who was in charge of the centre. Uh, that person explained to him that the daughter had been taken into Port Augusta shopping and she would be there the next day. But the next day came and went and she didn't arrive for a visit. And the same person, an employee of the Department of Immigration, came in and explained to him that his daughter was now back in Tehran. And if he wanted ever to see her again, he should voluntarily agree to return to Tehran and abandon his asylum claim. At first, he thought it was some kind of practical joke. But when he was persuaded by the documents that it was true, he had effectively a nervous breakdown and spent another eight weeks in solitary confinement until even the department's own psychiatrist said that it was driving him insane. Um, ultimately, when we learnt about it and went to court, the department's uh, just seeking an order that he be removed from solitary and be put in the general part of the detention centre. The department's argument at first instance to the judge was, you, judge, you do not have power to tell us how to treat people in immigration detention. That was the argument they made. 
The judge didn't agree. Judges don't like being told they can't do something. <laughs> um, anyway, they appealed that. They, they, they took the time of three judges of the federal court um, to, to argue that they would be allowed to treat detainees in any way they thought appropriate, without regulations, without judicial oversight, without any form of control. The, one of the judges, I remember, asked them, what are, what are you wanting to do to this man? What is it you want to do to him, apart from destroying him? And they said, oh, well, we just want to have the freedom to deal with him as we see appropriate. That was it. They lost, which is good. <clears throat> now, the whole scene for asylum seekers in Australia changed significantly when Kevin Rudd became Prime Minister in uh, 2008. Um, but then, uh, and, and he introduced <clears throat> in July 2008, a series of reforms which looked as though uh, we had achieved about 90% of what we were after. <clears throat> but then, Mr Abbott became leader of the coalition, started cons uh, complaining loudly about people smuggling, oh, sorry, about boat arrivals, and so Mr Rudd rapidly started criticising people smugglers. And he really went full throttle, abusing people smugglers as the scum of the earth, the lowest of the low, all that sort of thing. Um, he seemed to have forgotten that his moral hero, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, about whom he'd written in the monthly just before the election, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was also a people smuggler. So not necessarily the lowest of the low. Um, he seems to have forgotten that um, Oscar Schindler, who most of us read about and thought was a, probably a pretty decent guy, he was a people smuggler. He may not ever have heard of Gustav Schroeder. Gustav Schroeder was a people smuggler. Gustav Schroeder was f absolutely straight down the middle, a people smuggler by any test. He um, took a ship out of the port of Hamburg in May of 1939 with 900 Jews on board with the purpose of getting them to a place that was safe. He was pushed from pillar to post. He tried every dodge in the book, ended up at Cuba. He was warned off the coast of Florida at gunpoint and ended up going back to Europe and putting them ashore at Antwerp. A little later, when the Nazis overran the Low Countries, uh, more than half of those people were taken into concentration camps and killed. Gustav Schroeder had tried to save their lives. He was a hero then, he's a hero now, and he was a people smuggler. And by the way, it's a long time since I've thought of this, but um, in The Sound of Music, did it occur to anyone that the Von Trapp family were refugees and the nuns were people smugglers? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the, the Rudd experiment um, seems not to have worked out according to uh, the wishes of everyone. Boats started arriving again. It's worth asking us ourselves whether it should trouble us that boat people come here. These are people who have genuinely been bludgeoned by chance so that for them life offers so little that they are prepared to risk their lives uh, in a dangerous voyage to reach a country which has a different language and a different culture, they are most of them uh, people escaping the same extremists that we're so frightened of in the Middle East. It's really hard to know why we should be worried about them coming here. Maybe they're just the sort of people we want. They're fleeing our enemies and they've got the courage and the initiative to take whatever risks are necessary in order to get to safety. But it seems that when boat people arrive, that in itself is a cause for concern. It's tempting to bear in mind that the largest arrival rate of boat people in Australia was in the last week of January 1788. And some of them were illegal. Um, now, when, when Gillard took over the Prime Ministership, she was, um, to say the least, ambivalent about boat people. She said that she could understand people's concerns about the mistreatment of boat people, but she also said she could understand the concerns about Australians who saw boat people arriving. Um, her policies, as we discovered, um, went on to a new tack until by the time of the election in 2013, the federal election of 2013, um, the asylum seeker issue had got so heated and so florid that both major parties, for the first time in Australian history, both major parties tried to win support by promising cruelty to a particular group of people, namely people fleeing persecution coming here by boat. 
Um, that's probably the lowest moral point this country has ever reached. I hope we can recover from that, but so far the signs aren't very good. So what happens to these people? Well, when they arrive at Christmas Island, <laughs> typically they've been on a boat in discomfort for eight or ten days. Typically they've come from countries that are landlocked and they've never seen the ocean, let alone been on it. Typically they've had not enough to eat or drink during the voyage. Typically they have had no opportunity to wash or to change their clothes. Typically they arrive at Christmas Island wearing clothes that are caked with their own excrement. Typically, they are then interviewed by an officer of the Department of Immigration without being given the opportunity to wash and change. It's easy to imagine how humiliating that must be. It's difficult to imagine any respectable explanation for humiliating them that way. Once they arrive, if they have any medical devices, they are confiscated and not returned. Hearing aids, spectacles, false teeth, prosthetic limbs are all confiscated and not returned. Any medications they have are confiscated and destroyed. One person has a job of sitting in front of a rubbish bin, popping pills out of blister packs for later destruction. Um, if they have any medical documentation, it is taken from them and not returned. These are people who, if they have got simple controllable conditions, will not get appropriate medical help because no one really knows what their concern is. Uh, the consequences are pretty easy to understand. The UNHCR has written uh, critically about conditions uh, by which we're, we're treating people. Um, I'm sorry, I've just jumped ahead a bit because I get a bit excited. Manus Island. We have reintroduced, as you'll all recall, we reintroduced the idea of offshore processing. But this time it's with a twist. They're not just processed in... Uh, Manus Island or in Nauru, if they are accepted as refugees, and so far about 80% of them have been assessed as refugees, they're offered protection visas in Papua New Guinea or in Nauru, as the case may be. But they are treated with such hostility by the locals that they know they will not be allowed to stay there for more than a year or two and that life there will be made unbearable for them. In Manus Island, um, as many of you will recall, on the 17th of February last year, um, Reza Barati was killed. Scott Morrison initially said he had escaped from the camp and was killed by locals outside the camp. Soon he had to back down and admitted that Reza Barati was killed inside the detention centre. Um, within a couple of days, of the, or a couple of weeks rather, of the killing, I received a witness statement from a person who'd witnessed, a number of witness statements of people who'd witnessed the death. One of them read this way, in part. Jay is a local, all these names were provided, but I've anonymised them. Jay is a local who worked for the Salvation Army. He was holding a large wooden stick. It was about a metre and a half long. It had two nails in the wood. The nails were sticking out. When Razor came up the stairs, Jay was at the top of the stairs waiting for him. Jay said, fuck you, motherfucker. Jay then swung back behind his shoulder with the stick and took a big swing at Razor, hitting him on the top of the head. Jay screamed again at Razor and hit him again on the head. Razor then fell on the floor. I could see a lot of blood coming out of his head on his forehead, running down his face. His blood is still there on the ground. He was still alive. About 10 or 15 guards from G4S came up the stairs. Two of them were Australians. Uh, the rest are PNG locals. I know who they are. I can identify them by their face. They started kicking Razor in his head and stomach with their boots. Razor was on the ground trying to defend himself. He put his arms up to cover his head, but they were still kicking. There was one local. I recognised him. He picked up a big rock. He lifted the rock above his head and threw it down hard on top of Razor's head. At this time, Razor passed away. One of the locals came and hit him in his leg very hard, but Razor did not feel it. That is how I know he was dead. After that, as the guards came past him, they kicked his dead body on the ground. No one has faced trial for that killing. Uh, the, when I gave the Sydney Peace Prize speech last year, I repeated something which I had been told, and I explained that it was something I had been informed of. I haven't been there, I don't know whether it's true or not. But what I had been informed of, as I said, was that the two witnesses who'd given these devastating eyewitness accounts had been offered resettlement in Australia, but on condition that they withdraw their witness statements. 
Now, Scott Morrison, who didn't criticise any other single thing that I'd said in the, in the speech, criticised me publicly and said that that assertion was not true. Being technical, it was true. I had been informed of it. Um, but he said it was false. What I've learnt more recently, just in the last few days, and um, with independent verification today, is that those two, witness statement, those two witnesses were not offered resettlement in Australia. Instead, they were taken into a small room by Wilson guards. They were tied to chairs and beaten up and were then told that if they didn't withdraw their statements, they'd be raped. I think that is less creditable than offering them an inducement of resettlement in Australia. Those men continue to be terrified for their future, and uh, it, it may be for that reason that no one has yet faced trial for the, what looks like the cold-blooded murder of someone who was in Australia's care. Um, the UNHCR has reported on conditions in Manus Island and Nauru in late 2013, they said UNHCR was deeply troubled to observe that the current policies, operational approaches and harsh physical conditions at the processing centre do not comply with international standards. That's our processing centre in Manus Island, set up by us as part of the delivery of some kind of political promise. Uh, they also reported on Nauru and said, assessed as a whole, UNHCR is of the view that the transfer of asylum seekers to what are currently harsh and unsatisfactory temporary facilities within a closed detention setter, setting and in the absence of a fully functional legal framework and adequately capacitated system to assess refugee claims do not currently meet the required protection standards. Again, a system set up by Australia of which UNHCR is critical. Um, I received a very reliable report just a few days ago uh, that at the entrance to the family compound at the processing centre in Nauru, there are Wilson guards. The Wilson guards, amongst other things, receive uh, requisitions, written requisitions from detainees. The requisition documents are prepared by Transfield, uh, it enables them to requisition, for example, a pair of shoes or some soap or some toilet paper or matters like that. They hand in their requisition form to the Wilson guards and the Wilson guard says, but of course we throw them out at the end of the day. And that explains why it is that there are still detainees on Nauru walking around on the baking hot razor sharp rocks with no shoes at all or if they're lucky enough to have shoes, they fall apart very rapidly because of the conditions and they use cable ties to try and hold them together to protect their feet. Um, a number of you will be familiar with the fact that for most of last year, I was running a letter writing campaign for people held on Nauru and Manus. Um, the system was, since I'd managed to get hold of about 400 names and boat numbers of people in each of the two centres, the system was that, since I can't just distribute a list like that, the system was people would write a letter to some refugee, they would send it to me with a self-addressed envelope, and I would then enclose it in a, an outer envelope, address it to a particular refugee with the boat number, uh, and a sheet of paper uh, so that they can write a reply, because people get disciplined if they hand out writing paper to people held in detention, and, um, and also a note from me just explaining why they're receiving that letter. All of those letters were sent off. By June last year, no one had received a reply from anyone on Nauru. And a number of people contacted me and said, what's going on? We haven't had a reply. So I made some inquiries at the department and eventually found myself in lengthy email correspondence with uh, a, a woman who explained that the letters were being received and were being distributed. And then that, that was in June. And for the rest of the year, we were back and forth, back and forth, back and forth about why it was no one was receiving replies. Now, Nauru recognises Australian postage stamps. And we'd put $1.85 Australian postage stamps on every self-addressed envelope so that the detainee would have writing paper, a stamped self-addressed envelope, and could very easily write back to the person who'd written to them. But uh, eventually, this woman told me that in Nauru, they only recognise Australian postage stamps that have been bought in Nauru. I'm still wondering how they can tell. 
in any event, that run. So then we had then we had a back and forward correspondence about well, what do you do with all these replies uh, with Australian postage stamps on them, which the Nauru postal system will not recognise. And I said, well, look, there's only three ways of dealing with it. One would be to open each letter, uh, see the identity of the asylum seeker who's written the letter, and hand it back to them. The second, rather simpler, would be to bring all the reply letters into Australia and put them in a post, off a post box. Um, the third, I pointed out, would involve a serious criminal offence, because interfering with the post is always a serious criminal offence. She then said she was referring the correspondence to someone further up the chain. <laughs> That person has never answered any of my emails. She, all I get is an automatic message saying she's on leave. Um, so um, anyway, all of this is going nowhere for six months. And then two days before the Christmas break last year, all 2,000 letters that I'd sent were returned to me, unopened, marked return to sender. And they've all got postmarks on them, so you can tell the date on which they've been received uh, in... Uh, Nauru, and so during all of the months that they were telling me that the letters were being distributed, the letters were simply sitting there, unopened. Now, um, this was picked up by The Guardian Australia, and the department quickly put out a media release. Uh, they've ignored all of... No, they haven't ignored... They haven't answered my emails, in which I've asked them again and again why it was uh, that, the, that the letters hadn't been distributed when I was told last June that they were being distributed. The media release given to the press said, well, look, some of the people had left and the others said they didn't want to receive letters, which is seriously counterintuitive and it's also completely inconsistent with their correspondence with me in the second half of last year. But this is the sort of people we're dealing with. This is the way the Australian Immigration Department is behaving. And my understanding from people who work with the various service providers, both in Manus and Nauru, is the purpose of everything they're doing is to break the spirit of people who've gone there seeking protection. We are trying to break the spirit of people who've just tried to escape persecution. It is hard to believe Australia is doing this, and yet... The evidence for it is overwhelming. Now, it's a hard thing to be forced from your country. It's a hard thing to be bludgeoned by chance out of the country of your birth. It is an even harder thing to move yourself to another country with a different language and a different culture and different everything. And how much harder again when you've risked your life to get to safety, how much harder again to find that you are being mistreated, characterised as a criminal, uh, and being treated in a way calculated to break your spirit. That, ladies and gentlemen, that is the bludgeoning of chance. And the awful thing is that our whole system since 2001 has been based on a lie. And the central lie is that they're illegal. It started after Tampa. Tampa was a purely political exercise, but it started after Tampa, Howard started calling them illegal. And the message just below the surface is they're criminals. And then when the current government came into office um, in 2013, they renamed the Department of Immigration and Citizenship the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, which carries the distinct suggestion that we need to be protected from these people. Nothing could be further from the truth. But based on those lies, uh, it is now possible for officials of the Australian Immigration Department to behave in ways that I would not have ever thought were within the ethical reach of any Australian citizen. What we are doing as a country is unfathomably awful. And, you know, if an, we judge our friends' character by the way they behave. Well, so it is with countries as well. The character of a country will be judged by the way it behaves. And if it behaves very badly, it takes a long time to recover anything like a respectable reputation. We fancy ourselves as warm, generous, welcoming, open people, sun bronzed Aussies, all of that. Overseas, we are seen as cruel and selfish. Is that the country that you believe we should live in? Now, I know, you know people say, well, there's 70% of the public who accept and support this approach. Well, I suppose mistreating dangerous criminals is a rational possibility 
it's not so immoral as to cause you to turn away in revulsion. When you're doing it to innocent people, it looks very different. When you are punishing and driving children to try and kill themselves, it looks very different. It looks utterly inconsistent with the way we believe our country is. But that's where we've got to. Chance has not only bludgeoned those who seek safety here, Chance is bludgeoning the character of this country and the reputation of this country, and it will take a long time to recover the position we once had. We perceive ourselves, we imagine ourselves to be a lucky country. And I know Donald Horne was speaking ironically, but in most ways we are a lucky country. In most ways, most people who live in this country will never have their human rights challenged. In most ways, oh, I mean, you know, your rights are safe, as long as you're not homeless, as long as you don't have a mental disability, as long as you're, um, well, I could almost say, as long as you're not female. The disparity between the treatment of men and women is amazing in this country. Think about it. Think of the, think of the agonies. <laughs> Gee, my father would be upset to hear me. <laughs> but then he was of another era. Um, the, 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 think of the, think of the um, fact that we have a, a cabinet, a federal cabinet, originally with one woman in it, now with two women in it. Imagine what the public reaction would have been if initially it had only one man in it and now only two men in it. Does anyone seriously think that there would not have been an explosion of protest at the extraordinary unfairness of there being only one or two men in the cabinet? You know, that's, that's when you begin to notice the uneven treatment to which some people are subjected. But of course, that group whose rights are uniformly, constantly uh, at risk are refugees, in particular boat people. People who come asking us politely to help them, to protect them from persecution. Imagine for a moment, just for a moment if you will, imagine you are a Hazara. Uh, and you've seen what the Taliban are doing to people of your ethnicity and religion, you've seen what it means to be a Hazara in Afghanistan or in Pakistan, and after the worst outrages, you decide to make a run for it. And you know it's going to be dangerous. And you take that path down through Malaysia and Indonesia. They aren't countries that have signed the Refugees Convention. You can get a, a visa on entry, as any of you will know if you've travelled to either of those countries. You turn up, you get a visa one month. At the end of the one month, there's a problem. Even if you've been to the UNHCR office and you've got a piece of paper verifying that you are a refugee, um, you will have to hide in the shadows because if they the authorities in Indonesia find you, you'll be jailed. If you get a job, they'll find you and you'll be jailed. If you have children with you and you send them to school, they'll find you and you'll be jailed. And so you have to live in the shadows for as long as it takes for some country to offer resettlement. That will typically take between 20 and 30 years. I want you to imagine you are that person. You have a choice. You can take your courage in both hands and get on a boat and risk your life to get to a country that has signed the Refugees Convention that will offer safety. Or you can wait in the shadows for 20 or 30 years in the hope that someone will offer you safety. Is there anyone who would not get on a boat? I've never met anyone in Australia who wouldn't get on a boat. And yet we vilify and deliberately mistreat people who do exactly what we would do if we had the misfortune to be in their shoes. It is, I think, fair to say of every boat person that chance has bludgeoned them into a dreadful position. But if chance never gave them an even break, why can't we? Thank you very much. It isn't exactly easy to get up um, straight after a talk like that and uh, 
uh, <coughs> speak, but uh, it is my task, as it is, uh, has been my task for uh, each of the eight past years. <coughs> and indeed, this is the eighth year in which I thank the Faculty of Law here for honouring me <coughs> with this lecture and express my pleasure that it has not yet become the Halwarton Memorial Lecture. <laughs> <coughs> I know that this can't last forever, uh, but it is nice while it does, especially when you consider the alternative. <coughs> I can still endorse the view of George Bernard Shaw and Malcolm Fraser that while life was not meant to be easy, it can still be delightful. As always, I stress that my name is not only an eponym but a metonym. In contrast to a static creed, a vision such as the vision of this law school is organic and my name stands in for all those um, staff, students, administrators, benefactors who, as time goes by, contribute to developing, shaping and nurturing the vision cherished in this law school. We took our first students in 1971. Young Julian Burnside uh, had turned 21. So even if he had not had the misfortune to be born in Melbourne, uh, <laughs> uh, it would have been too late for a very happy conjuncture to occur. That had to wait four decades until he joined the board of our International Refugee Law Centre, generously endowed by Andrew and Renata uh, Caldor. In the meantime, as he told us, Julian had gone to Monash, opened seven years earlier. Back then, Monash and New, and New South were the two new kids on the block. Monash was the first law school in Victoria for 107 years, and New South was the first in this state for 116 years. On the Monash, Monash Law School website, a five-minute video celebrates its 50th anniversary last year. An early student, Julian Burnside, in it recalls something deeply impressed on him. Law is deeply embedded in society, and unless it is working for society, it is missing the point. A succinct way of putting part of a vision we share, one which enables us to assure our students that there are many ways in which they can live rewarding, satisfying and worthwhile lives in the law, as elsewhere. Or to use the eloquent phrase of Justice Holmes, for a man or woman to live greatly in the law as elsewhere. We like the Halwarton Lecture to illustrate this, as it has done tonight. Julian was a leading commercial and taxation barrister until, as he has told us, he appeared for the asylum seekers um, <coughs> in, um, in the Tampa case. Three years later, he wrote, I learned through the Tampa case something I should have recognised earlier, that asylum seekers are confronted by unjust laws being implemented by a government which has lost touch with ordinary standards of decency. <clears throat> it had a profound effect on me. I knew that it was not possible to stay in Australia and do nothing about these outrages. Julian's pro bono legal work alone meets that challenge, but there is so much more. He's given tremendous personal respect, support, comfort, indeed love to individual asylum seekers and families. Most remarkable has been his effort to tell the Australian public 
of the terrible things done in its name. This has indeed required courage and disregard of his personal interest. The quantity and quality of his public speaking and writing have been staggering. He, he even exposes himself to hostile shock jocks. <laughs> Julian has told elsewhere how whenever he was quoted in the media saying something outrageous, like it is wrong to imprison innocent children and drive them to suicide, <clears throat> he received a torrent of hate mail. He decided to answer it all. <laughs> Sitting up late at night, he answered thousands of emails, mostly abusive. The rudeness and vehemence of most was surprising, but what followed was even more astonishing. Nearly all responded, and every response was polite. Where appropriate, Julian replied with more facts to answer objections. About 50% ended up saying in substance, thank you for discussing the issue with me. I agree with you now. And about 25% ended up saying in substance, thank you for discussing this issue with me. I don't agree with you, but it is good that you stand up for what you believe. One can only marvel at his stamina and patience, not to mention his command of the cut and paste function on his computer. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, tonight, we heard a sample of what Julian has been saying publicly in many forums. Again and again, he has given these and many equally distressing case studies with checkable detail. He's been nonpartisan, saying that both sides of politics are in a race to the bottom in the mistreatment of asylum seekers. How has this indictment, built up over 14 years, been answered by those accused? With the single exception he has mentioned tonight, when he entered into some dispute with the minister um, over certain facts, and uh, it became fairly apparent that the minister was relying in, on information that had been, uh, uh, it, as a result of people being indeed bludgeoned in many unpleasant ways to change their stories. Ap apart from that single instance, I've been unable to find a situation where uh, his, what he has said has even been challenged. They, <coughs> those he, cri he criticises seldom even bother to shoot the messenger. Mostly, they simply ignore him. Two recent incidents show how our Prime Minister responds to criticism of government policy. The Human Rights Commission reported adversely on the effect of detention on asylum seeker children. And the UN Special Rapporteur, Rapporteur on Torture and Other Inhuman and Degrading Treatment had the temerity to uphold four complaints against Australia while he was dealing with hundreds from 68 countries. In neither case was any attempt made to answer the findings. In both cases, the reaction was to attempt to shoot the messenger, quite shockingly in the case of Gillian Triggs, and then adopt a holier-than-thou attitude pleading with injured innocence that far from criticising the government, everyone should be complimenting it for stopping the boats and thereby saving asylum seekers from drowning. Our poor misunderstood Prime Minister claimed that Australians are, and I quote, sick of being lectured to by the United Nations, particularly given that we have stopped the boats 
and by stopping the boats, we have ended the deaths at sea. What I am sick of is the hypocritical, self-righteous cant that implies that Australia is only interested in saving lives at sea and that that justifies treating asylum seekers cruelly, locking up their children, acting to stamp out any hope of a decent future. All the kind of terrible things that Julian has told us about tonight. Why do we not do this to stop asylum seekers coming to Australia in leaky boats? We do it to stop them coming to Australia, full stop. It would be easy to allow them to come to Australia to make their claims for asylum safely. Instead, we make it impossible for them to come safely. Australia left them with only the dangerous option, which the government thinks it should be congratulated for closing. I'm not suggesting that anyone wants the drowning of asylum seekers, but the brutal fact is that Australia simply doesn't want them, dead or alive. <clears throat> Many asylum seekers flee the Middle East, Iran and Afghanistan by flying southeast. Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, are not parties to the Refugee Convention, and no asylum can be sought there. But beyond them beckons Australia, which prides itself, or used to pride itself, on being multicultural, justice, law-abiding, and a party to the Convention. Having flown safely to Indonesia, why on earth do asylum seekers transfer to leaky boats. Because the airline can't sell you a ticket unless you have an Australian visa. Australia gives visas to investors, businessmen, tourists or students, but not asylum seekers. Australia thus cuts off air travel, leaving only the possibility of boats. In Indonesia, there are plenty of good sound boats capable of getting, and competent crews capable of getting them to Australia. They've been doing so for thousands of years. Why are they not used by asylum seekers? <clears throat> because when a boatload of asylum seekers arrives, Australia confiscates the boats and imprisons the crew. Australia again rules out the safe option. The only option left is a throwaway boat making its last trip with a makeshift crew. Desperate asylum seekers took the risk and a significant number, men, women and children, drowned. They continued to do this even when the survivors were cruelly treated and sent to small impoverished countries that could not offer them a decent future didn't want them and simply took them for an Australian bribe. That didn't look good, but in any event, it wasn't achieving Australia's overriding objective to see that asylum seekers don't get to Australia at all. <clears throat> so Operation Sovereign Borders and the Navy were mobilised at great expense to ensure that asylum seekers didn't have to even have a chance to get here in leaky boats. This is the action that Tony Abbott thinks so wonderful that it should silence all criticism of our cruel and brutal treatment of and our denial of all hope to the survivors who escaped drowning and are now at the mercy of the Australian government. It is, he said, and I quote, the most humanitarian, the most decent, the most compassionate thing you can do. The best thing you can do to uphold the universal decencies of mankind. Well, you've heard some de detail tonight from Julian 
about how the government upholds the universal decencies of mankind. The best you can do to uphold the universal decencies of mankind, what about allowing asylum seekers the safe, cheap methods of travel available to investors and tourists and students. I haven't gone through this exercise to argue that there is no real problem and Australia should th just throw open its doors to all asylum seekers. I'm not persuaded that if we did, the number of arrivals would be no more than the Australian public would accept. That is full of imponderables, but I feel at least confident, and it gives me no pleasure to say this, that the acceptance of, of such a policy by the Australian public would require a kind of political leadership of which I see no sign in this country, even on the horizon. The reason I have gone through this exercise is to expose the dishonesty of arguments based on the hypocritical cant that our interest is as humanitarians saving people from drowning. The truth is that we are a very privileged group in a world where suffering and desperation are growing apace and we want to protect our patch. Let us acknowledge that, at least to ourselves. The worldwide problems of refugees and displaced persons are beyond the capacity of any one country to solve. Let us at least start discussing them honestly and realistically. We weren't up to leading the world on climate change. Perhaps we can take up the cause of the millions of refugees creating in many countries problem is so great that they make ours look trivial. I'm delighted that our Caldor International Refugee Law Centre is embarking on this, striving to initiate informed discussion, for example, in recent collaboration with Australia 21 and the Centre for Policy Development. If Australia gets used to talking honestly about refugees, perhaps it will be able to recognise and retreat from the terrible wrongs it is inflicting on innocent people in the Rue and Manus. Perhaps it can repeal the shocking repudiation of its international obligations and its once inviolable standards of justice and fairness that was legislated through our Senate in relation to onshore asylum seekers on the 4th and 5th of December last, on the critical vote of Ricky Muir, blackmail, blackmail by a ministerial threat to deny, to deny relief even to the children among desperate detainees on Christmas Island. Julian's moving and enlightening lecture has led me to stray beyond my main task for which I earlier laid the ground. Would you please now join me in thanking him for his lecture and acclaiming him for his example uh, of how a man or woman may li live greatly in the law as elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you.